Welcome back, everyone, uh, from the lunch break. Uh, we have a very interesting slate again this afternoon, and uh, this is starting with uh, Coach Co Communications. Uh, we're glad to have with us uh, Philippe Jeté, uh, President and CEO uh, of Coach Co Inc. and Coach Co Communications. Uh, Philippe, merci beaucoup d'être avec nous aujourd'hui. Thanks for joining us. Well, merci, Jérôme, and uh, it's great to be here and be with all of you sharing this conversation. Great. So uh, first, uh, let's start with the, the talk of the town uh, on Rogers' proposed acquisition of Shaw. Um, regulators could potentially have an impact on the outcome of the transaction, and this could have an impact on on Kojiko. And if ever some of all of, our, of Shaw's wireless assets come up for sale, uh, would you be interested in participating in their acquisitions? Well, you're certainly t starting with a big topic, and I know a lot of uh, people have turned their attention to this one. Uh, there's a great deal of uncertainty as far as we're concerned uh, as to whether the deal uh, will be approved, if uh, wireless assets will be for sale, the implied uh, economics of all this. Uh, but first, I'd like to go back to the essential here, uh, and the essential element is really about regulation. Uh, if we want uh, the future of mobile in Canada to work, uh, we need to have a really uh, with the regulator or the regulators are there to, to deliver um, a balanced, competitive, uh, innovative, as well as, as investment based uh, framework. Uh, regulation does not need to be heavy. Uh, actually, it's far better when it's light touch. It needs to be fair and it needs to be predictable. So uh, that, that's what r really uh, we're expecting to see, that the regulator are going to also uh, look at this transaction. Canadians today, I think, um, uh, are concerned about this uh, proposed merger and for the for right reasons. I think it's uh, concerning uh, the way it's uh, being presented and uh, consolidate even further um, the, uh, the the market power that uh, the big three, not only Rogers, the big three, uh, actually have in their possession. This has been recognized over and over by uh, by the CRTC, by the Competition Bureau. So, the first and foremost, uh, foremost uh, thing that we need uh, is a regulatory framework that will support everyone, that will help the um, the smaller to grow as well as uh, invest, uh, innovate, but also to uh, introduce and preserve competition in a healthy marketplace. Let's, uh, it, it, for mobile, let's remember how uh, actually a regulator played a very important role at the very beginning. Uh, if we look at the big players today, uh, let's not forget that uh, Bell came out of um, actually six uh, monopolies from Bell Canada to uh, the Atlantic uh, Canada companies that uh, actually created the, the Bell that we know today. So they, they've they inherited a lot of uh, regulatory support uh, to, to get rolling in, in mobile. Same thing for TELUS, four mon monopolies, uh, certainly out west, BC, Alberta, but let's, let's not forget Quebec Telefon as well. Um, so tell us four monopolies that created the company that we have today. Uh, and Rogers was, was greatly helped by the Canadian government. They got favorable terms to actually uh, launch a business uh, initially with a partner. Uh, and over time they grew, they were uh, incentivized to grow and they eventually purchased Fido and Mobilicity. And then the other two competitive player also disappeared. Remember that uh, ClearNet and Public Mobile uh, were, were purchased by TELUS. So the regulatory framework is necessary to help the smaller player grow and to protect competition, to make sure that uh, the big players uh, can, can actually play by the rules in a market uh, really supported by competition. So mobile is a market where barriers to entry are very, very high. You need spectrum and or frequencies to, to build. Um, you need a lot of capital. Uh, so the, the access to, the, to a portion 
of the national incumbents network is actually fundamental to help the smaller players uh, grow. And uh, we've seen this in, in the past years. I think the government this time has to, uh, has to induce a framework. Uh, the regulatory framework needs to be uh, mandated and not just let to the three big guys to decide what they want to do with the market. So it needs to be mandated to create a wireless wholesale um, access to their networks and help um, smaller players to grow. And that's exactly what we've put in front of the CRTC. We've uh, proposed uh, what we've called an hybrid mobile network operator model, HMNO. And we're very, very anxious, eager to see when the CRTC will actually render its, uh, its decision uh, to, to, to open mandated uh, wholesale uh, wireless in, in the market. So. Uh, once we will have that, uh, it will be conducive to um, for more competition in, in Canada. And uh, Kojiko is exploring. Uh, we've been uh, we've been telling um, the market. Uh, we've been very clear with our intention. If the conditions are right, if um, we can access uh, partnership and network sharing agreements uh, in an accretive way. Uh, to create a reasonable rate of returns for our, our uh, investors, as well as a framework to pace the investments we will need to make uh, over time. And let's remember again, those big players have grown up over 35 years. So it takes a lot of effort to build a uh, good network and uh, small players need the time to build uh, similar networks as well. That's a, that's a very interesting uh, historical uh, perspective. And uh, just maybe since you mentioned it, uh, you're talking uh, a bit of what uh, what Kojiko would need to, to launch a successful wireless service. Um, are, are we also talking uh, an access to the RAN or to the core as well? Uh, how do you, what would you need to, uh, to have a successful wireless operation? Yeah, um, of course, we, I'll simplify it by saying we need access to their network at this, at this point, because it all depends on the important decision that the CRTC will actually, uh, is making right now. And I'm sure they're, they're considering the Rogers uh, Shaw proposal uh, in their thinking now to, that is reducing competition. Uh, to create the right type of wholesale access, uh, whether it's core or in the RAN uh, or boat, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll get to those details. But the key principle uh, is uh, introducing um, the right framework for Canadians. That's uh, that's helpful. Thanks. And uh, maybe one last one on uh, on the wireless uh, perspective. Uh, obviously, the 3.5 gigahertz spectrum auction um, is coming in June. Uh, which, with set asides for which uh, Kojiko could uh, could uh, qualify, do you intend to participate in this auction? Well, I've uh, said it a moment ago, we have expressed very clearly our interest in offering a wireless service. Uh, but until the, CRTT, the CRTC decision is uh, known, uh, we would like to keep our options open. And specifically about the 3.5, uh, you know, the rules are, of the auctions are very, very strict. So uh, yeah. we are not providing any comments uh, at this time. Yeah. I, uh, I understand that. That's fair. Um, now switching to your um, more core operations um, on the Canadian front, you're you're more present in rural areas than uh, than your peers on average. Uh, can you describe what are the main differences between uh, rural and more urban operation uh, generally? Yeah, for sure. Uh, there are, there are several factors uh, that actually makes very different businesses uh, for a communication company. If you're uh, playing in the regional, suburban, regional, uh, rural areas, first is the density. You don't have as many people per square kilometer. So density is a key factor in any business case. You don't have as much customers per uh, or the customer density as you'll find in dense urban centers. The second element is technology. So when you build these days, when you build something brand new, 
from like what we call the green field, uh, we go with fiber right away, fiber to the home. But when it's about extending or stretching uh, existing pieces of the network, uh, that's where um, there's, a, there's a nuance. We have an HFC network, an hybrid fiber coax, and we will either stretch a little bit more fiber or stretch a little bit more coax. And we do that in the most cost efficient uh, way possible because uh, the two platforms, fiber to the home or HFC, are uh, superior to many others in the marketplace, like DSL, what the, the, the most telcos are still offering, uh, DSL, uh, ADSL, VDSL, or... So uh, our superior platforms um, make us, uh, give us the ability to choose the best uh, technology to deploy, so density, technology. But there's a third factor. The third one is really being close to the communities you serve. And at Kojiko Canada and in the US, we serve a thousand communities. So uh, we know what, what, uh, what it is about to, uh, to live and work uh, and actually uh, produce um, uh, GDPs from, uh, from regional regions that are helping dense urban centers. So uh, people there, they need uh, good connectivity. They need also to be supported properly. And that's uh, what we're trying to, uh, to do every day at Kojiko is to work with the communities to build what, um, what they need to contribute to the economic uh, prosperity of, uh, of countries. Uh, and we serve customers with good jobs and local jobs. For example, in Ontario, our service center is in Burlington. In the province of Quebec, we are established in Trois-Rivières. And uh, so Canadian customers can be served by Canadian employees, uh, likewise for Americans. So acting local, being local, working with your communities is really key when you're a regional or like Kojiko, a super regional operator. Yeah, great. Uh, that's helpful, I think. Um, and now uh, on the pandemic uh, a bit, uh, we saw an acceleration uh, of margin improvement in Canada uh, last year uh, for your fiscal 20. Um, what costs could be back uh, when there's a reopening or what will change as a whole in the business uh, when the economy reopens? Yeah, well, we certainly see, saw a uh, margin improvement in F20. Uh, this is related uh, to uh, the pandemic in, in different ways. So uh, there was a sustained residential high-speed internet demand. So that, that was uh, certainly seen uh, everywhere. Uh, and this should have, uh, we believe, a lasting positive impact on our margin. So this, will, this is here to stay. Now, there was a decline in certain uh, operating expense. Uh, the need for sales or the capacity to sell, think of door to door, that was uh, completely out of the question in the, during the pandemic. So these costs uh, were, were out of the equation. Marketing activities because of the lower churn, uh, the last thing customer wanted to do was to change the uh, operator or service supplier during the pandemic. So churn was lower and marketing uh, costs have uh, diminished for the, uh, for the period. Now, the, we, we, ha we, we see um, there's clear hope and we see a, a slow economic recovery. Uh, vaccines are showing up, uh, population um, is actively working for an economic recovery. So we are ramping up our Epico IPTV service uh, in Canada, as you've seen. So there are some uh, cost element that will come with that, but uh, so should uh, come sales. Uh, one thing that is also here to stay is the willingness to be served uh, online or through virtual tools. Uh, I fundamentally uh, believe that the pandemic has changed uh, and now customers are more comfortable. Uh, they are willing to, uh, to, to jump on the digital um, toolkit. And uh, who, so, so we've seen uh, gains from, uh, from there that we will keep. 
because of all the digital transformation, we've also reorganized the Canadian operations uh, in the fourth quarter. Uh, I'm uh, looking and expecting an annual cost savings of about $4 million, so just more efficiency in the business. So all these things uh, together and the integration of the Retelecom that we've purchased as well in Quebec, uh, that's going uh, very nice, uh, very, very well. We, we are... Uh, the, the synergies are line of sight for the end of the year and beginning of next year, so all is good on that front. Great, uh, that's helpful. Uh, and now, um, maybe on the technology peers are are using, uh, we increasingly hear about uh, fixed wireless access. Uh, the big guys are mentioning it. Uh, we're often uh, that's that's a technology that could potentially make network deployments um, uh, more affordable for for your competitors. How do you see this technology evolving in the coming years on your footprint? Yeah, well, fixed wireless access is a tool in the toolkit, but it's marginal. Uh, the technology is clearly an inferior product when you compare it to the very high bandwidth and high speed of fiber and uh, wireline or HFC uh, network build. So, um, we we offer 120 megabit per second everywhere on our network. Uh, fixed wireless access can deliver 25 to 50 at best, so clearly an inferior product. But we are using it to link uh, isolated uh, residents. Uh, if someone likes to be on the top of the hill and there's not an economic way to build uh, uh, aligned to uh, to this cottage, we could use uh, fixed wireless access. So we use it too, but I see this as a uh, technology uh, tool to be used uh, here and there as opposed to a major trend. Uh, and we are not seeing any evidence of notable rollouts in our uh, territory for a couple of quarters uh, from our competitors. Okay. That's uh, that's interesting. Thanks. Um, <clears throat> and uh, also, we've seen the the announcement um, yesterday from the the government of Quebec, and uh, we hear a lot of these announcements uh, of government funding for uh, rural deployments. Uh, you mentioned in the past the impact on capex uh, for Coachco could be material. Uh, also, how could it impact maybe revenue growth and uh, and margins going forward? Okay. Yeah, there there are several programs, and uh, uh, we we have actually in our fiscal twenty one financial guidelines about twenty million dollar of capex um, linked to such uh, government programs. So I don't see this changing for next year. Yesterday we've actually. Um, uh, you saw the announcement of the Canada-Quebec high-speed program, uh, uh, province-wide expansion. So uh, there's about $30 million that we will see in F22 uh, for those um, network expansion in uh, in the province of, uh, of Quebec. There are several programs as well in Ontario right now. They're not all announced at this point. So uh, we could see further CapEx um, being uh, allocated to these uh, with those subsidy program to to extend our networks, uh, so we could see the capital intensity slightly increase in Canada uh, for F22, uh, and we have uh, on the U.S. side as well some expansions uh, and programs going on. But when you look at the other side uh, on the balance sheet, the shift from neutral to positive impact to a bit DA. Um, uh, are more beyond the two uh, the, the 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 build period, which is about two years. So for F23, uh, you can think of a uh, positive impact on uh, EBITDA margin. Great, thanks. Uh, now shifting to uh, to the U.S. side of uh, of the business, can you can you explain how different your strategy is in the U.S. Uh, versus what is done in Canada? Yeah, sure. There's a lot of similarities uh, first. We've actually, uh, uh, Kojiko Communication uh, decided to, to go south because we could, uh, with success, replicate the Canadian model, the regional model, or the super regional model that, uh, that we've come to develop over, the, over time. So that's what we also have in the U.S. Nuances and difference in the U.S. market is uh, more fragmented to start. Uh, so there we also have a, an increased focus 
on uh, growing through acquisition. So that's one. There is also um, uh, the, the fact that our competition is mostly DSL based, uh, telco DSL based. So we are leveraging there our significantly superior internet offering compared to the competition. Uh, and we're expanding uh, our footprint. So uh, there's that. We have a different uh, business model for the floor of the market as well, where we have developed uh, bulk uh, deployments, so large uh, gated communities as well as uh, condo towers. Uh, so there is a strong growth in Florida based on, on, on bulk uh, expansion. And we have uh, also larger businesses in, uh, in the United States compared to uh, the Canadian footprint. Uh, and on both sides, here in Canada, we've deployed IPICO, our IPTV. On the U.S. side, there's a planned IPTV platform for the uh, end of the year. Okay, that's, uh, that's helpful. I think uh, you mentioned uh, Florida. Uh, we've seen they, they are not in the same confinement uh, rules as, as uh, there is in Canada. Uh, what are the learnings you have made from from the most advanced stage of reopening uh, in states like Florida that could potentially be applicable elsewhere in your footprint? Yeah, well, the the only thing for sure is we never know. Uh, states and uh, and cities keeps opening and 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 not so um, and closing. Uh, so. Uh, certainly, Florida. Uh, we've we we were very more protected there by the long-term bulk contract nature of our business. Um, the U.S. in general, I could say, has been less impacted by the shutdowns. So the commercial uh, uh, revenue, the commercial revenue growth has uh, has been less impacted as well. Uh, the economy. Uh, has not slowed down as much as we've seen here. And now we have a massive injection of uh, $1.9 trillion actually uh, in terms of economic recovery plan. Uh, 80 billion is for broadband. Of that 80 billion, there's about 40 billion uh, in a stimulus program based on two things, availability, so making larger uh, networks and, and, and closing the digital divide between urban and uh, rural areas, but also affordability. So we've yet to see exactly how they will roll out $40 billion in afford affordability programs under that stimulus, but um, we, uh, we will work with, uh, with uh, different levels of governments uh, to, to see how, the, how it, this is going for the United States and Atlantic Broadband. Okay, uh, yeah, that's helpful. And um, regarding, uh, you mentioned on the on the last earnings call uh, that Kojiko was transitioning to a more broadband centric strategy. Uh, other companies are, are doing it as well, but what does that mean in terms of, uh, of your strategy, maybe more for your TV service or in general? Yeah, well, it's, it's actually about bringing broadband uh, center in our uh, go-to-market strategy. So uh, on the video side, um, we have regular cost increase, and now we are going to price the video product uh, more in line with the cost of delivery. Uh, so that will actually change the way we bundle things. It will be broadband first, and video and telephony uh, will will continue to be offered, but through modular pricing. So it's mostly a shift um, around broadband and in how we offer video and telephony. So that means, for example, we will no longer offer video only as a, as a standalone uh, product, except for some bulk uh, contract. Um, uh, so, so, so that's a, a representation of that change. But we are grandfathering, uh, obviously, uh, any existing uh, video customers. Uh, and when you com combine that with the rate increase uh, we've done in September, uh, the growth in bulk units, uh, we only expect a uh, reasonable and relatively modest video loss. So all in all, uh, it's increasing margins because uh, uh, broadband is at the center of our uh, go-to-market efforts. 
Great, like uh, consumers are doing too. And uh, we're getting tight on, on time. Uh, maybe last one, uh, more on your balance sheet and uh, allocation priorities. Uh, you just completed a significant transaction with Deri Telecom, uh, but, but still your leverage is reasonable at 2.6 approximately, uh, considering the relatively elevated valuation multiples in the US. Um, what are your priori priorities in terms of uh, capital allocation right now? Well, we've started the year communicating. We have three uh, key capital allocation priorities. They have not changed. Of course, the pandemic has slowed some things, uh, but we are pursuing acquisitions um, of uh, broadband businesses in the uh, United States, there are, where there are still a lot of independent service providers. Uh, we continue to be very, very well positioned. I think we've demonstrated our superior uh, ability to, 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 to operationalize and, and deliver great uh, business uh, results. Um, so uh, M&A in the United States uh, is certainly uh, our first capital allocation. The second um, is about enhancing and extending our existing broadband network. So there, there's what we would like to purchase and add to the business and what we already have. Uh, IPTV, I've mentioned it twice. Uh, so investments in uh, enhancing and delivering uh, a much better experience, customer experience uh, for video. We have the high growth opportunities of Florida that I've described earlier. We have several, several government uh, sponsors, uh, sponsored programs coming. Uh, the big one in Quebec yesterday, uh, Ontario and the US as well as other uh, projects to, uh, to, 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 to make public. Um, we have already uh, Seventy-five percent of our Canadian footprint at um, at uh, one gig one gigabit per second, and ninety percent of the U.S. footprint. So there, there's uh, a little bit more to do there, but already significant uh, investment made. Uh, we keep an eye on launching a um, wireless mobile service in Canada. So this will certainly keep us busy in the weeks and months to come. And on top of that, don't lose sight of two very important things. The 10% uh, buyback we do every year uh, under a normal uh, course uh, issuer bid, so where we repurchase 10% of our float. That was 165 million uh, in shares uh, last year. And we've increased and we continue to increase uh, our dividend for the past five years uh, by 10%. So uh, two uh, appreciated uh, by the investor community, I'm sure, uh, actions that we continue to deliver on year over year. So I would, uh, I would say that Kojiko, with all this, uh, the future is bright. Great. Uh, well, I, I'm sure uh, this was uh, very helpful for, for investors and potential investors uh, in, uh, in Kojiko. So uh, thanks for your time, uh, Philippe, and uh, merci beaucoup. Merci. Good afternoon, everyone. Bye now.